another week of interdisciplinary astronomy. We're going to be covering lecture two, and I'm going to give just a short summary, and Matt will follow up on that with some additional thoughts from the lecture. So, another week, uh, another week of so interdisciplinary. Got to mute myself on another screen. Okay. So, in the beginning of the lecture, Steiner um, introduces, you know, the Gertian idea that, um, it, I guess more than Gertian, but anyway, the, that natural phenomena reveal their true nature only if they're viewed everywhere in connection with human nature, with the human constitution as a whole, you know, really emphasizing this methodology. And he's contrasting this uh, with the so-called objective approach, which exclusively considers at least astronomy uh, according to the mechanical mathematical view. Um, and, and he touches a bit on the, the, um, the different pictures of the cosmos uh, throughout the evolution of consciousness and how much of what we uh, seems self-evident to us today uh, issues from the uh, Chaldeans, um, even though their picture of the earth being a flat disk and the cosmos overhead being a vault is something many would consider childish today. Um, and then he touches on the Copernican revolution uh, and uh, Copernican, Copernicus's three axioms and, and kind of draws out something about the third axiom that he'll bring, uh, bring in later. Um, and just emphasizing that Copernicus was seeking to really simplify the, uh, the complexity of accounting for retrograde motion um, in the other systems um, to try and simplify the, the, the epicycles uh, by uh, placing the center of the celestial movement um, in the sun. And uh, yeah, so Matt's gonna say a bit more about this third axiom when he comes in later. Um, but, but one of the questions that I thought would be important to, I guess, raise now and, and keep in mind later on that he asks, um, uh, well, what does it mean that the, that Copernicus assumed a perpetual, um, revolving of the earth's axis? Um, and that's not taken into account at least at a hundred years ago. I'm not sure what astronomers would say today. Um, but, and then also what he says um, about uh, this calling into question whether the earth actually moves around the sun in an ellipse. Um, and so he says that the fact that this is left out a hundred years ago, at least of the uh, approach to astronomy illustrates that there's burning uncertainties in science that this more comprehensive qualitative approach that he's going to offer um, may help us to, um, I guess, work with or, uh, live into in ways that the math purely mathematical approach doesn't really allow for because he says it lifts us out of concrete the concrete in a way that can potentially um, I guess blind us to things as they are. So he says what's really needed is for us to draw draw in the celestial phenomena as close as possible to ourselves as human beings and to cease contemplating them only as completely separate from our hu human constitution. So he's you know, gesturing toward this qualitative approach. And, and then he goes on to, as he says, lay a kind of elementary basis for that um, by uh, sorting out these three primary influences that we experience here on earth, the solar, the, tell the telluric, the earthly, and the lunar. Um, and then he connects these um, with the different aspects of the human being that he's articulated you know, in the anthroposophical picture um, so that in head the nerve sense system being connected with the solar influence the sun and the celestial sphere and uh, the earth being connected with the metabolic limb system and then the lunar being connected with the rhythmic system really interesting goes into this kind of morphology of the earth in connection with the polarity of the solar and the earthly and exemplifies this with the the, um, the the extreme, I guess the the polarity between the polar uh, the polar regions and the uh, the uh, tropics, and just talks about this these two different extremes of the way that the conditions here in those places where the earthly is very strong in the tropics and the 
uh, the solar influence is really strong in the polar regions that it creates a kind of, as he says, apathy in the human experience. Um, and, uh, and so, and it was also just interesting for me to think about like my, I guess, my qualitative association with, I've never been to the polar re regions, but when I think about it, I think about it from what I've, you know, gleaned from movies and stories as being a kind of quiet place, um, which, re which reminds me of like the, the way he talks about the head as being kind of this immobile um, aspect of the human being, you know, that kind of rests upon the, the rest of the moving body. In contrast to the tropics where I have been, I have been to uh, the Amazon and it is like, it is like this churning cauldron, you know, that really I felt fit, you know, what he describes uh, this correspondence with the metabolic, the, the earthly being really strong there. And then the temperate region um, as being this kind of harmonic place in between them, which he says allows for a more balanced development of the human constitute, I guess, inner life. Um, so, and he goes into a little bit the, the, the day as a miniature year, these self similarities, um, the life of imagination in connection with the lunar cycle. Uh, and 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 is gesturing also um, to you know this this need to conceive of the human being as a kind of telescope or instrument, um, and so to to uh, to get a sense for the cosmic and the, the interplay of these three forces um, by an observation of our inner own inner life throughout the year, as well as the outer reflection in the metamorphosis of insects and how you know, what kind of impression we might receive from that. Um, and so he's, he suggests that we might overcome a lot of the, uh, or begin to overcome a lot of the uncertainties that attend the purely mathematical view of astronomy if we take uh, this larger uh, view where our human constitution is being woven out of these forces. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there. So I'll let Matt follow up from that. Thanks, Ashton. Um, I'm not going to try to summarize. I think Ashton did a, a good job at running us through the major points here, but I wanted to speak a bit to the way Steiner's drawing our attention to these shifts in worldview or in mutations in the evolution of consciousness, we could say, that bring us through from the Chaldean to the Ptolemaic to the Copernican understanding of the astronomy, it seems that there's always a, as there's a shift in the human being's understanding of, of themselves, there's a shift in our relationship to the sky, to the heavens, and how we understand uh, what's really going on up there and how it corresponds to what's going on within ourselves. One of the important points Steiner makes is that in terms of pure descriptive and predictive accuracy. The Chaldeans could already predict eclipses. They could predict where the planets would be, even though they were considering the earth to be a flat disk and the heavens, just this half sphere sort of dome over the earth. Similarly, the Ptolemaic model, though it has the earth at the stationary center, can make perfectly accurate predictions. And what Copernicus was attempting to do was to simplify the curves to 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 account for retrograde motion of the planets in a way that would be geometrically simpler than this Ptolemaic approach, which requires all sorts of deference and epicycles and circles upon circles. The Ptolemaic model is quite complicated. And rather than trying, I mean, there's some controversy here about whether Copernicus was trying to say, no, no, the sun really is at the center and the earth moves around it, or if Copernicus was just trying to say, well, we can think of it as if it were this way, and it makes the math simpler. Now, it's it's known, and, and Steiner, I think he points this out explicitly, that Copernicus's model with perfectly circular orbits, it, it's actually less accurate in terms of making predictions than Ptolemy's model or, or Tycho Brahe's model. 
And so it wasn't until Kepler added ellipses and, and Newton made some refinements that it actually became more um, accurate, or at least just as accurate as the Ptolemaic model. It's also interesting to note, Sonner doesn't say this, but the, the Ptolemaic model of the solar system is still accurate enough that it's used when um, engineers design the projectors for uh, planetariums to produce a simulated image of the heavens. They're basically uh, building the, the projector instrument on Ptolemaic principles, right? And so as a purely a matter of prediction, all of these models work very well. And in the modern period, what shifts is this desire to know how the heavens really move, how the earth is really oriented in space around the sun. And this, this raises the question that, um, you know, Owen Barfield might, might think of in terms of idolatry or, um, you know, this, this ushering in of this mechanistic worldview where, you know, not only is the earth being thrown into motion, but with Newton, all of a sudden, um, you get the collapsing of the difference between the sublunary spheres and how the elements behave below the moon. You get a collapsing of that with, with, um, the celestial spheres and how these heavenly um, bodies move. You know, for Aristotle, there's two very different sorts of um, principles that play above and below the moon. Newton says, no, no, there's a celestial physics. The whole idea that you could have a celestial physics would have just uh, not made any sense to Aristotle or to Ptolemy. But Newton is saying, no, the same law of gravity that determines how this apple falls from the tree determines how the planets move around the sun. And this is where I think the key um, shift that Steiner's trying to point us to having to do with Copernicus's third axiom. This third axiom, it's this third movement that Copernicus points to in addition to the Earth's rotation on its own axis over 24 hours and the Earth's uh, revolution around the sun at over 365 days. Copernicus said there's a third movement, uh, which Steiner refers to as the annual day. And this is related to the precession of the equinox. It's related to the wobble of the Earth. Because of the modern mechanistic view of gravity as a force, this, this, prece this precession is explained as a result of the moon and the sun's gravitational influence on the Earth that it causes this wobble in, in the over 26,000 years uh, in the earth's axis, uh, axial rotation. Steiner says that contemporary astronomy leaves out this third motion and that's true, but the way that contemporary astronomers and astrophysicists would account for this is in terms of a gravitational influence, right? So Copernicus was just looking at the geometrical motions Nowadays, there's this added element of something called uh, a gravitational force that is used to account for this wobble. And so when Steiner says modern astronomy doesn't consider this, it's true, but it's because they've modern astronomers and astrophysicists have tried to account for it in a different way, which you could say, again, following Barfield is a kind of idolatry. We're conjuring invisible forces to explain visible motions, whereas Copernicus was trying to explain this uh, along the same lines that we understand the other motions. Um, but this is a very subtle point that Steiner's making, and I, I hope I am understanding it and conveying it to you clearly, but I'm very eager to, to discuss this with everyone. Um, trying to understand the relative movements of, of heavenly bodies is uh, <laughs> quite a, an exercise in imagination, right? Because you have motions upon motions upon motions. And when you, when you consider that the sun itself is moving, um, you know, and Steiner will introduce these lemniscate patterns later on, it really does complicate these simple models of the solar system, um, that are presented to us as school, school children, uh, it's it's quite misleading. It is idolatry to think of the sun going around the earth, even in an ellipse, uh, much less of a, a circle, which is how it's usually presented. Uh, and so, so we really do, we are engaged in an exercise 
in the cultivation of our imagination in order to follow Steiner. It, it almost feels like it takes a bit of clairvoyance just to understand these movements. Um, and so I think we'll all be stretching our imaginations as we go here. I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to everyone else's input on these difficult questions. Lorenzo's already ready to go. Go ahead, Lorenzo. Hello, everybody. Ciao. Uh, yeah, uh, I understood the, the part relative to the, the third action by, by Copernicus differently, but mm, I might be wrong. I, I just say what, what I did understand, and then I'll have a look. Uh, I will Google it and, and try to, to discover some confirmation of this, because I, as I understood it from the chapter, uh, Steiner was referring to a motion that uh, had length of one year, because he was speaking about the fact that since the um, the axis of rotation of the Earth has uh, an angle to the ecliptic, which is the plane where the revolution around the sun uh, lays, then uh, we would expect to see um, um, the, the North Pole point to different stars during the year. Let's, uh, uh, let's suppose that, uh, yeah, it's pointing to, towards the, the North Star uh, at the, at the vernal, uh, the vernal equinox, then you move, uh, six, uh, six months, you should be uh, translating the uh, the um, the movement around the sun. But uh, if the the angle to the elliptic was to say the the same, then we would be pointing uh, at a different angle. While uh, Copernicus, as I understood it, thought that during the year. So he was speaking about a wobble that had length one year. Uh, the Earth rotated just like the moon does, so that uh, it's not just staying in the plane of the ecliptic, but it's also pointing always at the same uh, at the same uh, uh, point in, in, with the North Pole. So it's like. Uh, um a throttle that uh has let's say uh 30 degrees inter inclination when it's this side of the sun but then as it moves around it has a, a third inclination this side of the sun so that it still points to the same uh to the same point up north or down south let's say he, he observes the fact that the north uh, the north star stays there and the cross of the south or whatever stays there so that we have the same latitudes all, all through the year. And so Copernicus has to say, well, since there is this angle of inclination, then it must rotate with the same uh, speed of the yearly revolution around the sun, but contrary wise, so that uh, we can we can have we can keep the points, but I don't actually uh, understand it uh, fully because, to my understanding, then uh, if you if you, even if you kept the same point on the North Pole, then it would change dramatically regarding the South Pole. So I uh, I'm quite sure that the Steiner is speaking about a yearly movement, but I can't really understand um, what this law is about. But I don't think it's yeah. the uh, uh, the twenty six thousand year uh, lunar so sorry lunar precession because mm. he's here speaking about a year cycle, right? Yeah, no, I uh, what you're sharing is very helpful. I think even if we're even if you were talking about the precession, there would still be a slight shift every year. I mean, one twenty six thousandth, you know, of of, yeah. an, of of an angle. But what you're bringing up an important point that doesn't wasn't fully captured if if my explanation is correct because Steiner does talk about this but I do think that contemporary astronomers in this case would say 
while Copernicus thought the stars were much closer, um, he still thought of the, the the fixed stars as a kind of dome, a little bit bigger than maybe Ptolemy did, but he thought they were much closer. And so he had to account for this very slight shift, which would be noticeable, but contemporary astronomers would just say, well, the stars are actually much further away. And so we don't notice that that the pole is is shifting in what it points to. Um, and so that's why it's yeah. just dismissed as not relevant, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the point. And I also think that the subtler point you were trying to make, the, the one about the, the relevance of uh, gravity as a force, and then has an additional effect that is not just uh, the the effect of the sun on the on the earth, but it's also the combined effect of the the sun and the moon on the earth that gives this more complex movement. While uh, if you're thinking about of immanent movements, like the uh, is something that is caused from from within you know from uh, the external force of gravity then yeah you would have to explain for a third uh as copernicus did you had to look for a, a third source of uh of motion like there were three vectors acting together uh, in, in the earth while today we don't have to to see it that way because we just see that if we take into consideration more bodies, then uh, uh, we get a gravitational effect that is more complex, but it's the number of external bodies that you count since you're thinking about uh, a relational force like gravity and not like a self-induced movement like the, the will of, of, of the planet in question. Then that would uh, assume, yeah, for an additional vector to explain that that wobble. I think that 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 was the the subter point, and that that holds. Yeah. yeah. Leaf is asking about verifying Copernicus's seven axioms. I didn't actually bring out the Revolution Avis to, you know, check to see what Copernicus's axioms were. I kind of just took Steiner's word for it. Did you actually look in there, Max? Well, that's what I found from a quick internet search, but no, I, I, I don't have, I mean, I, I guess the, I mean, the text must be actually accessible, huh? Probably. Um, Do, yeah. Has anybody else asked about this? Maybe I'll just uh, make a comment. I really think uh, Lorenzo was hitting on something, something um, especially crucial. The question of um, what I say, like extrinsic movement, uh, movement sort of imparted mechanically of these bodies as compared to something like imminent movement, um, the way you know living things are animated not from some external force working on them, uh, but from like an innate, um, innate telos. Uh, and I think the moment you start to compare the planets with embryology, then um, let's just say like that, compa that comparison of between the planets and embryology it would be extremely far-fetched unless we discard the idea of the planets moving like merely as a result of extrinsic forces to them. And so I think that that's really that's really at the heart of, of what China is going to be going to be inviting us to consider. Can I yeah. ask another? Oh, yeah, I, go ahead. I, I do. Um, Angus actually uh, alerted me, or uh, kind of, um, yeah, alerted me to the work of uh, Kopi Vijaya. And the point about, and I was uh, trying to familiarize myself with um, the, some of the like tenets of reciprocal reciprocal theory, and um, I'm uh, curious if anybody has looked into the question of um, how scalar motion, 
the theory of scalar motion could apply to the planets here. Maybe that's something for the future, or maybe that's something completely irrelevant, but I was exceedingly curious about that question. And it might be Angus is the one that's, um, that's best prepared. But. Yeah, I was hoping Gopi would be with us today to, to help with some of these questions. Angus, do you have any thoughts about that? Don't know if you are able to unmute. I think the. I was just going to say that um, in can connection talk. with what Max and Lorenzo have uh, brought um, as far as imminent movement, the um, just the way that Steiner phrases that um, third axiom as uh, resulting in uh, an, an, an annulling of of what would otherwise, I guess, overtake the the consistency of the pointing um, as having this, well, I, my response, like having this impression of something like an imminent movement or something like uh, autopoetic. Max? Yeah, I, I kind of uh, just skipped over this and didn't think it was worth sharing, but then I, I considered it again and I realized people might actually think this is quite funny or quite interesting. My first recourse to try to settle the question of like, what is actually uh, Copernicus, Copernicus's third axiom? Um, my first recourse was to chat GPT and I asked, uh, what is Copernicus's third axiom? And it said, it gave me what I presume is Newton's third law. It says Copernicus's third axiom, also known as well, I don't know. I think it's mixing up Kepler and Newton. It says the law of harmony states that the orbital period, oh, I guess this is Kepler, states that the orbital periods of, of the planets are directly proportional to their distances from the sun. Some kind of a definitely not what Copernicus is saying. This was a key concept of Nico, Nicholas Copernicus's heliocentric model of the solar system. Um, and then it said, and then I said, double check, I don't think that's right. And it says, uh, however, Copernicus three axioms aren't as widely recognized. Um, and so basically uh, doesn't have an answer other than that. Maybe, yeah, I don't know, if anyone has something to comment about that, I'm pretty sure ChatGPT completely um, dropped the ball on this one. Yeah, it's conflating an axiom with the law and yeah, not talking about Copernicus, but Ke Kepler. Um, uh, well, I, I did find a, a forum thread to speak about this. It's actually the, the third movement. It's, it's neither... Kepler's law, no, mm -hmm. nor one of the axioms by Copernicus, but it was Copernicus's third movement. Mm -hmm. It was a yearly wobble around our, of the uh, Earth axis, so it was not procession because it was yearly. But as you said, uh, it was something relevant as as long as you imagine the stars to be uh, quite close. To just like just further than the Saturn or something like that. Then when you moved around the sun, uh, the, the position of, of the stars would have changed during the year. So you you had to to imagine this uh, this wobbling of, of the Earth. But uh, actually, since they are uh, now thought to be much much uh, further away, uh, this becomes irre irrelevant. That's what I, I managed to gather. Anyway, it's called uh, Copernicus's third movement of, of the Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, Karsten, did you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, I think the discussion we're having here is why Steiner is pointing us in another direction uh, in kind of researching or investigating this question, where in a sense, what he's making is some kind of He's taking some kind of phenomenological point of view, where he's um, he's discussing how how the solar uh, the, the the cosmos affects our life world. You could say it's it's a phrase that he, he didn't have, but that's in a sense that's how I understood him. That that we could, if we want to understand the cosmos, we can ask ourselves how does it affect our life world. And then he has this 
analysis of, say, um, the place where we live on Earth, how that will affect our mentality, how that will somehow shape our understanding of the world or, or, or play a role in, in shaping our understanding of the world, allowing us to develop some um, mental faculties that are not, that wouldn't be available to the same extent if we lived in, in uh, other regions. And it's due to these different forces that, that come into our life and, and kind of play a role here. Because I, I, I mean, of course, we might eventually develop some mental faculties, imagination and so on that will allow us to understand these things very clearly. But I think also he's kind of pointing us in another direct, direction that I think of as more phenomenological, uh, although it's inspired by Goethe. And his, uh, Goethe has this, he's quoting Goethe in, in the beginning of the text, um, uh, stating that we should look for how, how all these forces and so on enter into our human life. And we shouldn't take the human being and the life world of the human being out of the, the question if you really want to understand these things. So yeah, I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, thanks, Karsten. I think that's exactly right. You know, I, when I began uh, sharing a bit earlier, I was emphasizing the way in which as a matter of predictive accuracy, uh, the Chaldean, the Ptolemaic, the Copernican, the, the Keplerian, Newtonian, like they, they all more or less work. Um, with, but surprisingly, you know, Copernicus was less accurate than Ptolemy's, even though it's upheld as like this breakthrough into the modern scientific world picture. It's like, well, if predictive accuracy is what you're after, it was actually a step back. It needed to be tweaked, which is which is what Kepler and, and Newton did. Um, but even then, we still use the old Ptolemaic model for various purposes because it's quite accurate. And so what is this modern mechanistic scientific picture for? This picture that leaves the human being out, just considers us a speck of dust on the periphery, not relevant to how we understand the cosmos as a whole. If modern science is seeking predictive accuracy, then it's going about it in a confused way. But if it's if it's seeking more than just a sort of predictive descriptive accuracy, but a an account of the way it really is, then to succeed at that, we're going to need to bring the human being, the observer, back into the picture. And when we do that, rather than just looking at um, measurable, calculable motions, we're also considering our own inner life and how our own inner life is in correspondence with the shifts in the daily, nightly rhythm, in the lunar rhythm, in the in the annual rhythm. How is this changing our qualitative life? And from there, we can begin to understand what what the cosmic reality is rather than trying to construct a mathematical model in our heads uh, based on measurable curves and so on. Yeah, maybe I can add something here because I think the, the important thing about this Coper Copernican revolution was that what you got was a more mental model in a sense or a, a, a model that needed a higher level of abstraction to understand, you needed to abstract from your immediate experience of of the uh, of the world. Uh, so it allowed us to develop some new faculties of mind that has kind of went um, crazy in all this abstract modeling, which is where we ended up today. So so I think also a point that Steiner perhaps is making is that. We actually need to integrate all these different levels of our being. The, the, the abstract mental models that we've been become so um, good at developing, we need to kind of bring them back into our life world and have some kind of interplay between our immediate experience and all these abstract models. Mm -hmm. 
Lorenzo, did you discover something new? <laughs> uh, yeah, I I was messing up before. I think now I I get it. I copied, I pasted a, a picture that's a picture relative to Copernicus' third movement. That's the, the title of the picture in, in the chat. And there you can see clearly that it's actually the opposite. It's not that uh, the Earth is inclined this way and then it moves around the sun and it has to be inclined this way because as as I said it wouldn't make sense it would make sense for the North Pole but not for the South uh, and the stars were already thought to be distant enough uh, so that wasn't relevant either the point is mm -hmm. that uh, since the stars are very far and what is and the North Pole and what is the South Pole stays there, then the the Earth, unlike the Moon, and that's some, something that confuses us maybe because uh, what I get in my version at least, uh, there's, uh, Steiner says that the Moon, uh, the Earth like the Moon, always faces the Sun in the same direction. And that's exactly the opposite. It's unlike the Moon, the, the Earth, while moving around uh, the sun keeps the same inclination. And so what it's pointing at very far away, it remains the same because it's moving like this. But then, and once again, we, we go back, and that was right, uh, to the difference between thinking about gravity as a result of, uh, of the different bodies you, you get around. And, uh, and so that, uh, a more complex movement can can arise. Uh, uh, Copernicus thought that uh, a third motor was uh, to be justified for a third movement. And so the fact that uh, the Earth didn't move fixed to the plane, but was fixed, remained in the same position and moved relative to the plane, that was to be accounted for. So what Steiner is bringing up here is that uh, actually uh, what Copernicus did wasn't useful for calculations because it's an abstract model. And since you have to observe things from the earth, you still have to use a quasi Ptolemaic model because in the end, of course, you, you're, you do observe uh, retrograde movements and uh, and that kind of complexity. So to to actually point telescopes, you have to use a Ptolemaic or quasi-Ptolemaic mode. And at the same time, that uh, uh, Copernicus model is not even very good for, uh, for explaining reality on a just purely theoretical level, because this third, uh, this third movement, which today we do not understand as a separate movement, but just the result of, uh, of complex forces is actually not explained because uh, I'm not sure about this, but I guess that even today there is, uh, we discover new kinds of, uh, of motions around, around extra, uh, in, in extra solar uh, system, uh, in other solar systems that we see, and we discover planets that behave uh, strangely to our presuppositions and that maybe face all the time the planet or other or others that behave just like the earth does and uh, we we every time we have to build new new models to really explain this so I think that what Steiner is pointing to that is neither good for phenomenological uh, description and so not very good for the calculation of where to move the instruments, where to point in the sky, and at the same time is not really good as a, a theoretical explanatory model either, because there is a necessity to uh, to introduce a third movement or to postulate the emergence of complex phenomena that that so still uh, keeps us in the dark after all. I, I hope I managed to, to make myself clear. If, if if I didn't, please just just ask me. I I think I get it now, but uh, 
Hmm. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Lorenzo. Lots to chew on there. I'll enjoy rewatching this. Um, Angus, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, it feels like just on the question that Max asked, it feels like there's a whole load to say there. So they, I don't want to dominate this conversation. I'm going to pick out a couple of the bits that I think are specifically relevant to Max's question, which I think I'd encourage people to go and see. It's where Gopi's talking about this himself. The, uh, there's a channel called Reciprocal Systems RS2. Uh, look that channel up and uh, that's where his videos uh, are. Um, so, um, so let me give an example of a reciprocal system, which he talks about, and it's something I've long been fascinated with, and I've also got into arguments with astrophysicists about. If um, the thermal gradient, if we if we think of a normal candle, we are so sort of like we are thoroughly familiar with the idea that as as we as we move away from the candle, that the warmth is like dissipates. Um, my guess is it's just like it's a it's a distance squared relationship to that, but I don't know enough. I can't remember enough physics to say that. Somebody might like to come in there. So, what does a reciprocal system mean in this sense? It says that so, like this is you're only seeing one half of reality, the complete reality there, because there will be an equal and opposite um, manifestation of a thermal gradient going outwards. So like where you have the opposite effect, whereas is uh, so instead of getting colder from the from the center outwards, you get warmer from the center outwards. And anybody knows that, that any anybody who knows anything about the sun knows that this is so like the archetypical example. So like the the standard model is that there are nuclear explosions going on or nuclear fusion going on in the sun. And then, um, then so like this in, intense, amazingly intense heat, so like so like permeates out, and uh, then um, we get so like the sunlight. However, the data so like contradicts that model because you've got so like the sun corona, which is millions and millions of degrees hotter than the surface of the sun. So if you think about it, that is the opposite model of. So like the, the, the standard thermal gradient that we are looking for. This is an example of a reciprocal system. Um, Lorenzo mentioned, well, you've all mentioned gravity, but so like you were in on gravity, so like right at the end there, what is gravity? Gravity is a phenomena, so like which obviously, as we all know, so like brings us down to earth. So in this reciprocal system, we automatically assume that there is an equal and opposite force or there are there will be manifestations in the universe that show the complete opposite direction and we talked about this last week when we uh, we, we exchange words levity and etheric forces and and these type of things so this is the idea of reciprocal i'm going to give one more example of reciprocal before i try and touch on um scalar one thing that go gopi points out in his video um, is that if you ask Google or any scientist for the uh, wavelength or the frequency, the frequency of magenta, you will be told it's a, an illusion. What you're really seeing is red and blue in the absence of uh, green. So magenta doesn't exist as a freak. Uh, doesn't magenta doesn't, according to modern physics, have a frequency. Now, for those that know Goethe's color theory, you'll you'll remember that it is the um, what do we call it? Uh, uh, somebody help me here. The uh, uh, complementary. <laughs> Thank you, Lorenzo. It's the complementary color of green. So this is it. So like in a different qualitative aspect, so like that uh, green itself has like an an an, an opposite, and these are reciprocal um, and. Uh, both so, so all three of these uh, phenomena are observable but they they create a whole okay so this is part of what reciprocal is behind and uh, if Go gopi was here i'm sure he'd like be able to correct me on um any slight like, minor deviations from what he said but i think i've got it there in essence 
And obviously, oh, I did want to, yes. Okay, so now moving to Scalar. One of the things that Steiner says in this lecture that one way of describing what Copernicus did is he just, he just simply uh, moved the coordinate system. I don't know if you remember that. So that's quite a, quite a, a, quite a potent phrase. What, uh, one of the ideas that Gopi is talking about is so that we need a different, so a, a scalar system, um, which, it, um, how can we put this? So a scalar system is something that will collect, connect these two opposites. It's like into a, uh, into, it's like a unitary whole. Okay. And in his model, um, he, he goes into some depth about how s the speed of light in, um, is actually the, it's the center, uh, it's, 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 it's unit one, it's like on a continuum. And on, in, in his model, if you go to the left, you get obviously, so like sub, uh, uh, sub, uh, light speeds, um, material world. And you get uh, su super light sweet, uh, speeds, which are it's like non, uh, or which are it's like eth ethereal, should we call them? It's like be beyond the material. And one of the reasons I find that particularly interesting um, is because he, what Gopi is describing, I don't know if anybody's here here is familiar with a guy called Walter Russell. Yeah, Carson's nodding his head. I'm seeing a lot of similarity there because, and this you can also take this from other parts of Stein's lectures, everything is light. So in a scalar system, if light is the fundament, uh, fundamental unit of, of the universe, matter is everything that is sub, uh, sub, uh, sub light speed. And this ties in so like very nicely with Walter Russell's uh, ideas about uh, I, I, I can't go into it so like uh, it's like too deeply here because it was a couple of years since so a couple of years ago since I studied it. But material phenomena is sub light speed phenomena, and then super uh, light speed is that part which we are so like. Uh, which we don't have direct access to uh, through the senses. Um, and so the essential nature of a scalar model is that everything is reducible to one element. And what is that element? It's light. Light in us, it's like the, the super, uh, super, uh, super light speed is thinking. Steiner tells us about that and condensed light is material. So you can get that out of his, um, out of his other courses as well. So that was just like a brief attempt to answer uh, Max's question. Thanks, Angus. Um, I just dropped a, uh, a link to uh, an essay that Gopi wrote that, is, that explores a lot of these things. Uh, Max, did you want to go next? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, uh, quickly about how what what you find, and, and this is uh, really typical in in the entire like uh, process of discovery as a function of the scientific method. Um, when some observation is not accounted for by the theory, the first the first uh, uh, like the first response is to invent a new force or a new motion or something like that. Um, and I would just say, um, I think, just consider that like for the earth, we're trying to, so whenever the, what the earth actually does deviates from our predictions of what it would do um, as a function of the, the, the forces and the models that we're already interpreting it by. Uh, and then it does something, it deviates from that. Then again, we have to add some, some new force, some new vector to the, to the model. But just consider how everything is solved, really, if you imagine the Earth as actually like a, uh, like a, sensitive, a sensitive being, and the Earth is actually like, um, you know, turning always to, to face some, some object, whether that's out in the cosmos or towards the sun, you know, if the Earth is actually seeking 
to to uh, or, orient towards something, then it's almost like uh, when we try to add, add the the vectors or the forces um, in a kind of um, additive way, we're never going to arrive. It's like turning the thing. It's almost the, the problem of of the number one. Like if you go back in the ancient mathematics, one was the greatest number, uh, and all the other numbers are derived from one as like fractions of one. Uh, and then something at a certain point in history that seemed to flip, and then suddenly one is the smallest. One is just a unit. It's the smallest number. Um, and so if I just I, I thought I would just uh, propose that as like a different you know, fundamentally almost reverse way of approaching the situation. I think if I understand Steiner right, he's also um, inviting us to do that. That's great. Yeah, like that distinction from starting a uh, number arising out of an experience of the whole versus a presumption of atomism and discrete units. Um, Alex? Yeah, hi, everyone. I wanted to share my experience of uh, when I was doing the biodynamic training. Um, yeah, no, it's quite a few years ago. We had some astronomy courses in that training. Uh, and it was very interesting for me. And I had mostly the same perspective of the universe that we get in normally in school, the heliocentric universe. But it was very interesting to contemplate and actually being in, in nature and looking into the skies every day and contemplate how having the Earth in the center just makes so much sense to our experience of, of being and seeing the earth, the, the movements of the sun and the, and the planets uh, from this point of view and not from an abstract outside uh, point of view as you would need to, to, or at least as I feel I would need to, in order to start to imagine the heliocentric model. And also interesting to... Uh, see how uh, especially plant life is uh, deeply related to uh, those movements out of a geocentric um, point of view. Uh, not only how they, yeah, well, they react to night and day, of course, uh, flowers will open to the sun and will close to the moon, but many other more subtle uh, movements that are taking place in, a, in the metamorphosis of the plant that make sense out of a geocentric point of view. And I also wanted to share, let's see, I wanted to share because I had also the, the opportunity to meet later on. That's uh, a German um, independent researcher in astronomy. You can probably look him up called Hartmut Worm, if that's correctly uh, said. He has a book called The Signature of the Celestial Spheres. And his work is very interesting. He has created some sort of software that plots uh, the movement of uh, the different planets in the solar system in relationship to each other. And I have a picture here. I will try and show this to you. So this, for example, would be the movement of Venus uh, with the Earth in the center, uh, plotted, I don't know how many uh, years this would need in order for you to get to this uh, image. But it's, it's interesting that it is a five-shaped pattern, and maybe, I don't know if we'll go into this uh, in these lectures, in the coming lectures, 
the five that five shape pattern will will appear uh, in uh, some families of plants. Um, so, and for me, I mean, seeing these shapes and in terms of meaningfulness and and beauty, I think these shapes gave me something that was missing from the heliocentric model. Uh, but again, not to say that, I mean, I think they, they are complementary, of course. So it's not to say that one is better than the other, but uh, there's a richness that is brought when you can understand and contemplate more than one model. Thanks, Alex. You know, I'm, uh, I'll hand it off to Karsten in a second. But I'm just thinking about, you know, if if we accept that absolute space and time are have been superseded by this notion of relativistic space and time, which means all motion is relative, and I I don't really know where Steiner would stand on a question like that, but it, it is just as accurate to construe the center of the coordinate system as on the earth on the sun on the moon um you could you could derive a predictive model with either of these any of these three bodies at the center or any other planet and you could still have a predictive model of of where other bodies would be in the sky right but when it comes to how and i so so a question here would be if we could let's say grow and we, we might soon have this happening, growing plants on the moon. Will their shape be affected? Because uh, pre presumably, you know, the earth does follow the, 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 the moon follows the earth. And so it would be similar. The, the pattern that Venus makes would be quite similar, but it would be a little bit different. Um, maybe we would notice this effect more if we tried to grow plants on Mars. Um, then the shapes that the planets took relative to one another would be quite different relative to Mars. Um, it'd be an interesting experimental um, test of, of this sort of idea of these subtler cosmic forces and their influences on, on life, thinking beyond just gravitational influences. But anyways, that just is an interesting experimental idea that occurred to me. Um, Karsten, go ahead. Uh, well, the, the, the beautiful picture that Alex showed us just brought to the fore of my mind that you need to remember that when we look at the heavens and the motions of the heavens, what we're seeing is symbolic structures, something in need of an interpretation, like you have it in astrology, for example, which is kind of a perspective we've collectively forgotten. And we look only at predictions, but we should remember that these are expressions of life and consciousness and and thus symbolic structures in need of a, an interpretation or part of some kind of communication yeah good point karsten angus i'm going to try and tackle that question you had matt about uh, relative uh, relative motion, because it, it touches on the point that I was trying to make about uh, the, the speed of light um, and does tie in very neatly with what Stein has said in other contexts. Some of you might remember his, uh, his description of how matter comes about. It's like a, it's like the, the falling down of spirit. It's like it, it condenses. It's like it gives this sort of like waterfall image of how it's like uh, it crystallizes out of cosmic forces. And what, what Gopi was presenting in the think the uh, video that I linked to is that as things go below the speed of light, they go, become material. And as they and when they are, if I'm interpreting Gopi right, okay, uh, and everything supra speed of light is, let's call it force. Okay, because force is one of these very strange things. The force of gravity acts immediately everywhere in the universe, and that defies by nature the speed of light, so like restrictions that Einstein um, 
uh, touches on. So where we see force acting, there we've got already evidence of the other side of this, uh, this whole reciprocal system uh, uh, going on there. Um, and I do want to come back to that, this other thing that he said in his science, others, it might be the boundaries of natural science, I'm not sure, but he, where he definitely makes this parallel between uh, thinking electricity and matter as all being, uh, thinking light electricity, matter as all being the same phenomena. You've got a unity there. Um, but of course, light, if you, if you read the Upanishads, then sort of like light is, uh, so like thinking is that which sort of like is faster than anything. It's sort of like it's, it's instant, it's throughout the universe. It's a bit like the force of gravity according to sort of like the physics models. Hmm. Um, raises a lot of questions for me, but we're at the top of the hour now. Um, so I'll have to save that for next time. I, I mean, just briefly, I, I, I mean, are you, Angus, attempting to contradict the way that gravity is normally considered by saying that it's instantaneous? Because my understanding is it propagates like a wave. I mean, at, at the speed of light. Uh, I am I'm contradicting you. Yes. Okay. And I do believe well, I'm standing on as like good uh, scientific ground. Yeah, I'm not claiming one way or the other. I'm, that's just mm -hmm. my understanding of standard astrophysics. Yeah. Okay. No, my, my, it is. It's. It's instant. Uh, so like, a, 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 it's like if I move this teacup on my on my desk here, that has an instant effect throughout the universe. It's the basic idea of and gravity. The, okay, we'll have to explore the. So it's, it's a this. force, and this is one of these things that physicists struggle with. What is a force? Right. Big questions. I think we need to uh, put a pause on it for now and uh, continue contemplating this over the next week. We'll read lecture three. If anyone wants to present um, and, and introduce this next lecture, uh, please do email us and uh, we'd welcome that. Otherwise, Ashton and I can keep, keep doing it the way we have. Um, yeah, this is going to require, I can tell, a lot of additional research um, beyond just what Steiner tells us, because he's entering into conversation with um, cutting edge science in his day 100 years ago. And now we've so much has happened. In some ways, it's gotten worse because we're so much more astrophysics is so much more lost in abstractions and mathematical models. And we've lost touch with the phenomena, um, even more so than, than was the case in Steiner's time 100 years ago. So we have our work cut out for us. Can I, can I say something on that one? I encourage people go and look on YouTube for people trying to explain gravity. That's like they've got some they've got some interesting theories to explain this uh, supra speed of light or instantaneous throughout the galaxy. There, there are videos out there that try to do it in a materialistic paradigm, but it's still interesting because you yeah, have some things. For sure. Last thing I'll say, <laughs> this is just such a juicy topic is that you know, since Einstein's general theory of relativity was, the story goes, experimentally verified in 1919 with the eclipse, um, there have developed, um, I think, something like 40 alternative models of gravity, which are empirically identical. In other words, they make the same predictions as Einstein's. Many of them don't require this idea of curved space, and there's other differences. And so, there's a lot of room for um, further exploration, but the standard story is just, oh no, Einstein, we know what gravity is now, it's a curvature in space. And it's like, well, if we're gonna be really scientific about this, there are many other candidates for interpreting the data that we have, right? And so it's not, it's not a closed book um, in terms of how we understand this mysterious force, this mysterious power, um, however we wanna think of it. Uh, Whitehead has his own alternative to Einstein's, for example. Anyways, there's lots of room here for us to to get in and uh, reimagine the whole nature of, of contemporary cosmology. So look forward to that journey with all of you in subsequent weeks. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>